But our top story now on this eve of the next round of impeachment hearings is how Congress is so quickly grinding forward in the impeachment probe. Consider where Congress is just tonight, balanced between those three witnesses who spoke last week. You probably caught some of their testimony. It was also caught by over 13 million Americans. And then look at the witnesses this week, starting tomorrow. Eight of them. Now, in a typical congressional schedule, these kind of investigative hearings could easily take over a month. And let's be clear, in a criminal probe, like from DOJ, and I've covered my share of them, this kind of thing would take at least six months to a year or more. And I mention that because, as you may have heard, Chairman Schiff has actually argued his committee is now doing exactly that style of probe, because unlike, say, the Russia investigation or Clinton's whitewater issues or, of course, Watergate, there is no special counsel on Ukraine. There's no special counsel or DOJ operation that is revealing evidence or facts or testimony for Congress to review. Congress is gathering all this itself, and Congress is pressuring witnesses itself, and it's getting some results. Take the heat on Gordon Sondland. It's moved him towards more admissions about the Ukraine plot in private. And so this week, Americans will hear from him for the very first time. He's going to be something of a reluctant star witness who was on board and helping execute, at least for a time, Rudy Giuliani's famed shadow foreign diplomacy. Sondland wasn't a typical ambassador. He had this access to the highest levels of the administration and the president. The Wall Street Journal has now obtained new evidence today about how it worked. And this is pretty damning stuff that Sondland will almost surely be asked about this week. And I'm going to run through it with you briefly right now before we turn to our experts. I'm about to show you this new written evidence that multiple officials, including Mr. Sondland, basically saw Donald Trump's call with the president of Ukraine as a premeditated operation to get Ukraine locked into investigating the Bidens. Again, this is based on what they said, not any other criticism. Sondland emailing before the infamous Ukraine call that he talked to the Ukrainian president just now, quote, he's prepared to receive the president's call. We'll assure him that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation and turn over every stone. And you have Mick Mulvaney responding in these newly leaked emails. I asked the National Security Council to set up the call for tomorrow. Now, this is important because consider how the House Republican lawyer picked at certain details in his questioning, offering a kind of a defense by emphasizing things like the Ukraine president brought up Giuliani first, didn't bring up Donald Trump bringing up Giuliani, that somehow maybe this was just something that was kind of unfolding in front of the president, that Trump wasn't pushing a planned bribery conspiracy to get something from Ukraine, but things just popped up. Now, lawyers make those kind of defenses all the time, and they can work if they're true. So why am I telling you this right now? Because these newly leaked emails fact check that attempted narrative. They offer contemporaneous evidence that these top Trump officials were prepping and coordinating and executing the premeditated plan to do what Giuliani had been cooking up to get these probes of Biden and the DNC done by a foreign government. Now, in our Constitution, if those probes were a bribe extorted in exchange for military aid, well, that's impeachable. And maybe this is why today some Trump allies are now arguing these public hearings are exposing things they'd prefer stay secret. Having this all come out into public has weakened that relationship, is, has exposed things that didn't need to be exposed. This would have been far better off if we would have just taken care of this behind the scenes. Would it be better off behind the scenes? Well, it depends who you're talking about, right? Senator Ron Johnson, of course, has two roles in this scandal as a senator. He would vote in any trial of President Trump. But he is also an effective witness, basically, because he spoke with key players in the scandal, including, guess who? Mr. Gordon Sondland, who allegedly told Johnson the military aid was linked to those probes, meaning linked like a bribery plot. Now, Johnson says, according to these accounts, that he actually called President Trump to demand answers, that he was pushing back in real time, and then Trump then denied it. So again, not casting any aspersions here, that may be a good thing for the senator. That may be a good thing for people who didn't want this plot to happen. But we have other witnesses who say the opposite. So who knows, right? Well, the impeachment investigators are going to try to figure that out. They're going to try to ultimately know with enough evidence for the public to make up its mind. Meanwhile today, also the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, offering up a preview of a potential timeline for any trial. It looks to me like the House is going to be on this until Christmas. Then it comes over to the Senate. It displaces all other business. The Chief Justice of the United States is in the chair. Uh, senators are 
are not allowed to speak. They have to sit there and listen. And I'm not sure how long it will go on. I'm joined now by Nancy Soderbergh, ambassador to the U.N. under President Clinton, Timothy Edgar, former White House and NSC official in multiple parties, a senior fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute. We should mention he's also the author of Beyond Snowden and former federal prosecutor and congressional counsel John Flannery. Uh, good evening, Hi. everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh, Mr. Flannery, on the investigative footing, I begin with you. Sure. Uh, your view of the power of these emails, because they were written by the principals and they look bad. When I was a kid, there were a lot of these movies in which the ceilings would come in on the good guy and the walls, and that's what we have here. And these emails are powerful because they remove some of the phony arguments which you sometimes hear in courtrooms and you've certainly heard on the Hill, which is, well, what about this and what about that? And have you proven this? And could it be this and the other thing? All hypotheticals without any evidence. And the burden of a prosecutor usually, and I think the House is taking this seriously with Kaufman and Schiff, is uh, to close off those holes, because this is an important undertaking. We're talking about perhaps removing a president of the United States, a rare occasion and historic occasion with unprecedented misconduct. And so the fact that not only do we have Rudy starting this in 2018, but we have Sondland in this embarrassing situation of having uh, text messages and emails and communications that show that he had this deal he thought hammered out before the telephone conversation on July 25th between the president and Zelensky. So we have a, a very damaging set of facts here. Mm. I mean, this would be a plea bargain in real life. And I can't <laughs> believe there hasn't been a delegation that's gone to the residents today mm. and said, maybe we should talk about this. Well, you're echoing something that a, a fellow prosecutor uh, in the same Justice Department you served in said on this program, David Kelly, who was SDNY U.S. Oh. attorney. He said uh, <laughs> citizens would plea on this information. Uh, you wouldn't go to trial with this much evidence. The president, no. obviously, it's different. And the Senate trial is a different structure. Nancy, just, just to take a step back on the diplomacy, given your great expertise in your service, um, had you ever seen anything approaching this in any of your work uh, in government where, where you have this donor diplomat saying, hey, uh, we've, got, we've got it. We're going to have this foreign government go after your, your domestic rival. We just need to have a call about it. No, I've been in government for decades, and I've never seen anything like that. What's unusual in particular about this whole episode is the president using almost $400 million in critical aid to Ukraine for his personal benefit. And that's what this is all about. And I think it's high time that the supporters of the president stop trying to hide from the truth. And they should know by now. Look at all the people who've already gone to jail from mm -hmm. trying to lie about this. They need to just say, all right, the president held up aid for political uh, gain. And they can argue that's not an impeachable offense, that the Senate won't convict them. But they can't try and... Uh, if they haven't seen by now, and we have eight witnesses coming forward this week, all of whom are going to say that this was um, what happened. So you're and convinced on that, just, just the way you're putting it, you're convinced the public evidence shows that President Trump was abusing the U.S. taxpayer dollars to try to extort uh, election help? I think that is exactly what happened, and they can spin it however they want. But the facts are that the president held up $400 million of aid in exchange for dirt on the Bidens. Now, that's the facts. Now, the Republicans are going to argue, as Nikki Haley already has, well, nothing really happened. The aid went through, and there was no investigation of the Bidens. Well, the that's because the whistleblower blew the whistle, and they decided they better back off. And the defense... Uh, is not clear from the president. You have a different trial balloon every day. One minute it's well, nothing really happened. The next minute is all this stuff. Trial balloon, uh, no was pun intended. Trial balloon, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I think what they really need. This is serious. I don't. I don't think the president takes this seriously enough. Mm. He's tweeting during. He's intimidating witnesses. Uh, another obstruction yeah. of justice, and let the me, Democrats are just racking up the obstruction of in, justice let charges. Let me bring in Tim on this as well because I want to get him a turn. And Tim, take a listen to what the Secretary of State said. When Ambassador Yovanovitch was on the Hill on Friday, the president made a tweet mm -hmm. right when she was appearing, saying that everything, uh, everywhere that she went turned bad. Um, is it an assessment that you agree with? I don't have anything to say. I'll, I'll defer to the White House about uh, particular statements and the like. I, I don't have anything else to say about the Democrats' impeachment proceedings. 
Uh, Tim, this, this comes amidst new reports that there's a lot of strain here between the president and his principals, including the secretary of state, a senior administration official I'm reading from NBC, says the view was that Trump just felt like rein your people in, get control. Yeah. Uh, your view of that and that propriety, and I'll remind viewers, uh, you have a lot of experience like others on the panel, including uh, being a national security official for George W. Bush. I mean, I think there's just an undercurrent of rage inside the national security apparatus. Um, the State Department professionals are being mistreated, intimidated for telling the truth. Uh, and then their boss, the Secretary of State, instead of standing up for them, you know, defers to the White House. Now, of course, it was difficult for him to say anything else at that point. I think people understood that. Um, but they feel alone. They feel like they're under siege and they're not being protected by the secretary. And so I think that's really what's going on here is that you've got uh, pretty much unanimity, unanimity uh, among the national security uh, professionals uh, who served for many, many years or decades uh, out of patriotism uh, that, you know, when they come out and tell the truth and cooperate with an important inquiry, uh, that they're going to be attacked by the president and that they're not going to get backed up by their boss, the and secretary of state. You're saying that's wrong. Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, Mike Pompeo, he needs to he needs to stand up for his people. Uh, and if the president doesn't like that, then fine, he can be fired uh, or he can I be have forced to, to just, resign. Let me just jump in here, too. I mean, this is the secretary of state failing to stand up to yeah. his own employees who are being vilified by this process. And, and that cowardice statement from the secretary that you just played, this isn't about impeachment. This is about the president of the United States attacking his ambassador for no reason. That's and, not the impeachable. And, and that, me, that's just abuse. Bring, yeah, that's I right. Think, I think it's that's not the first important. time. I mean, we've seen that. Well, Tim, yeah, I was going to say. with the intelligence community. Well, and and pa yeah. Pompeo is trying to figure out whether he wants to be a Trump loyalist and be able to run for uh, the Senate or be secretary of state. And that is no longer tenable. He has to pick either represent the building or get out and go run for the Senate. But and, he's trying to do both and it's not working. And, and Tim, that brings us back to, to the point that you and Nancy are agreeing on, which is in your experience, which, as we've mentioned, is in national security in both parties. There are obviously intense policy debates, and they become democracy debates about what to do with our foreign policy. That is, in a healthy democracy, supposed to happen, and it goes on. Um, but when you see this level of undermining of the independent career public servants, be they at state or the Pentagon or anywhere else, uh, it does, is that, in your view, rise up to also a part of what the Congress says may be the president overstepping his authority? Sure. It's as part of the overall abuse of power. I mean, we saw that with Sondland in the first place with Giuliani. They were trying to bypass the system that's set up to safeguard our national security with the National Security Council, with the interagency process. And of course, the person in charge of that, John Bolton, is no liberal. You know, he's a fierce no. <laughs> conservative Republican. And and so you, the, the point is, though, that he was loyal to his people. He was loyal to the process in a way that Trump found inconvenient. So he tried you know, to go around him. And Tim, right. Nancy advised me earlier this is serious. So I may get on her bad list, but I would have to mention uh, Mr. Bolton would be grammatically upset to even have the sentence with the word liberal in his name in That's the same right. sentence. That's right. Uh, if you know sure. Mr. Bolton. And so it goes beyond but the ideology. Um, Flannery is coming back for another item. I want to have one more question here to the ambassador. Uh, take a look at Speaker Pelosi, who's someone you know from her work, from her oversight, from her time on the Intelligence Committee, uh, putting the challenge to the president today. Take a look. The president could come right before the committee and talk, speak all the truth that he wants if he wants, you don't to, expect him if he to, wants to take the oath of office, or he could do it in writing. He has every opportunity uh, to present his case. We've got about 30 seconds, Ambassador. What do you see her doing there? Well, right. He's invited the president to put the evidence forward, and apparently the president's willing to consider that. This is an administration that's refused to let people with firsthand knowledge testify. The one who knows the most is the president, and I hope he does it. He's under investigation, apparently, for not telling the truth under the Mueller investigation. So this is his chance to come forward. Mm. The truth will catch up with him. The sooner he puts it out there, the better. Uh, striking, striking accounts from people who've been in it. National Security officials Soderberg and Edgar, my thanks to you. John Flannery comes back. Thanks so much. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here. Or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.